Hello and welcome to the FDA Project Data Sphere Symposium on Data Sharing. I'm Bill Louf, president of Project Data Sphere. Now, the mission of PDS is to catalyze efforts to leverage data and data science to improve outcomes for cancer patients. This is the 10th in this symposium series that started in 2015. Uh, each symposium has focused on some element of our mission, bringing together experts to share information and views and to identify specific actions. That's the hardest part, is identifying specific actions to move things forward. And I'd like to challenge everyone who's attending today to um, identify a specific action. And you can put that in form of a comment or a question in, in the chat. Um, now it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, my colleague, Dr. Donna Rivera. Donna's Associate Director for Pharmacoepidemiology Real World uh, Data, Real World Evidence at FDA's Oncology Center of Excellence. She is previously Scientific Project Director and SEER at the National Cancer Institute. Donna, I'd like to uh, welcome you and uh, invite you to give us your perspectives on the importance of this symposium. Thank you so much, Bill. I am also very excited to welcome all of you to our collaborative FDA PBS symposium. And as mentioned, this marks the 10th year of our partnership. In the spirit of collaboration, we are focusing on a very salient topic, data sharing. Especially now, data is abundant and integral to drug development. FDA is responsible for advancing public health by helping to speed innovations that can provide safe and effective treatments, as well as assuring the public get the accurate, science-based information they need to optimally use medical products to maintain and improve their health. While data is more plentiful than ever, we know that data is not evidence. We need ways to use this data to provide evidence and helpful scientific information to inform novel uses for existing drugs, as well as optimizing clinical trial design, public health policy, communication with patients, drug shortages, diagnostic testing, drug repurposing, and post authorization safety and monitoring, and many more. COVID-19 has amplified the need for data sharing alongside evaluation of data quality, application of rigorous methods, and scientific collaboration. Indeed, COVID was a catalyst for the scientific community, fo forcing adaptability, creativity, and flexibility with an unparalleled level of collaboration and multi-stakeholder research to inform pandemic response. This was true across the evidence generation continuum from adaptations for traditional RCTs to rapid analysis of real world data where trials were not yet available. An example of an interactive, diverse, multi-stakeholder community is the Reagan-Udall Evidence Accelerator, focused on answering key questions on the natural history and treatment utilization, as well as more recently, methods and vaccine safety to address the pandemic. In the UK, the recovery trial is an example of a pragmatic adaptive trial design where an intense collaboration of 186 active sites is continuously learning more about potential treatments for COVID-19. Can we take these examples and the lessons learned to understand what is feasible and how can we sustain the progress made during this global pandemic? From a regulatory perspective, the use of the highest quality data to provide clinical evidence in evaluation of benefit risk is needed. We cannot generate evidence without data. And data sharing is a crucial opportunity to widen that evidence base. Specifically, data sharing may benefit populations that are not easily studied in traditional randomized trials, such as in rare cancers, pediatrics, or biomarker subpopulations. Increased volumes of data may also be able to generate better insights across populations within a disease. For example, within racial and ethnic subgroups or older patients, critical information to advance our collective goal of health equity. The use of master protocol designs or common control arms speak to the opportunity for collaboration and sharing to enhance patient-focused drug development. Data sharing can also boost evidence generation through leveraging pooled clinical trial data for examining drug safety and adverse event rates, disease modeling, biomarker development, drug repurposing, and discovery of novel clinically meaningful endpoints. The FDA gains knowledge from the use of pooled data analysis and drug development and review, 
welcoming additional evidentiary insights from expanded access to powerful data resources. Data sharing requires a collaborative, community-focused, on specific, a priori purpose, fit-for-purpose data and research questions that support transparency, reproducibility, and validity through methods, harmonization, and analysis. Examples of data resources that build on these principles at the FDA include federated models like the FDA Sentinel Initiative, which has transformed drug safety monitoring for medical products, as well as public-private partnerships, such as this partnership with PDS and the partnership with the Critical Path Institute, which is building a data repository through the Cure Drug Repurposing Collaboratory. These are just a few examples of the many public-private partnerships that promote the development of new tools, methods, and approaches to foster innovation and bring efficiency to FDA-regulated product development. Across the Department of Health and Human Services, there are several examples of data sharing. The NIH has developed a data sharing policy for grantees, established a genomic data commons, and more recently, the introduction of the STAR Act has prompted the development of resources to advance understanding of pediatric cancers through the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative. More specifically, a National Childhood Cancer Registry and a Federated Pediatric Cancer Data Ecosystem are foci of this effort, and we'll hear a, a bit more about that a little bit later. The Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT is integral to the conversation around data resources and sharing, and has several initiatives around interoperability and governance while ensuring patient protection. Additionally, the 21st Century Cures Act has inspired the creation of a common set of data standards, which is in progress. The department is focused on data sharing with an emphasis on the principles of transparency, sharing, privacy, and security. Another example that has emerged from COVID-19 is HHS Protect, a data platform and hub that aggregates disparate data sources for use in informing healthcare system planning. Based on this cadre of examples, the why for data sharing seems evident. It is about answering the question of how. And today, I hope our discussions think boldly about the common challenges of data sharing and focus on modern solutions. Data sharing is hard. From designing, linking, and pooling data to the complex analytics required to analyze such data, a wealth of expertise, forethought, and resources is necessary to build useful sources of evidence. Surmounting the scientific hurdles to more effective drug development and review requires collaboration, willingness, extensive high quality data input, and significant resources for harmonization and interoperability where the barriers faced often include concerns around ethics and patient privacy and protection and consent, intellectual property and commercial competitive interests, financial investments, and academic credit among others. We encourage various stakeholders to consider the benefits of sharing data to support drug safety and evaluation for the benefit of patients, including be able to share data with patients and providers more quickly and facilitate more facile drug development to bring much needed therapies to patients. Evidence generation, whether from the use of real world data or randomized controlled trials, or even both using innovative trial designs should be conducted with the highest scientific integrity and patient-centered. With that common goal, evaluating the needs for data sharing and ways to solve the current problems while mitigating risk is the purpose of this conversation. How can this community increase our knowledge to answer key regulatory science questions that serve our mission in protecting patients and promoting public health? Particularly relevant themes in putting together this symposium that we hope emerge are the patient voice in data sharing sustainability practices in sharing and reuse, and keeping the focus not on the problems, but on finding sustained solutions to accelerate progress together. Thank you to the excellent panelists who agreed to join us today, representing a diversity of perspectives from patients and clinicians to data scientists and researchers, as well as industry foundations and fellow government colleagues who are very active in the data sharing conversation. And thank you to the planning committee, including the staff at Project Data Sphere our NCI colleagues, and my FDA colleague, Sandeep Agrawal, for their dedication in setting this symposium up for success. With that, I'm so pleased to begin what is hopefully going to be an exciting and enlightening symposium. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Bill. Great. 
Thanks, Donna. That was that was great. Um, I'd like to just mention a couple of things about Project Data Sphere and uh, comment on why I think we're here today. Um, PDS is a nonprofit cancer research company. We were launched in 2014 by the CEO Roundtable on Cancer. In partnership with SAS, we operate a data sharing platform. And that platform has grown over seven years to, um, to where it is today with uh, over 200 uh, data sets representing 240,000 patients. And there are now 115 publications based on uh, that data. Something that's happened uh, really just launched in the last week is a new entity called Clinical Research Data Sharing Alliance. And this is a federation of the uh, many data sharing entities. And we're one of the founding members of that. I think it's a step forward and it gives us some infrastructure or some structured way to work on standards and interoperability and uh, ways to influence policy and also mutually support one another. Now, among that group, um, as much as we are colleagues and, and supporters, uh, Project Data Sphere is a bit contrary in, in at least two ways. Number one is rapid access to patient level data. So almost all users get access in 72 hours to the patient level data. Uh, the other way we are uh, contrarian is that uh, the users can choose to do their analysis on the platform using SAS analytics for free, or they can download the data into their own environment. Uh, we think both of those support data sharing in unique ways and in, in many uh, important use cases. Um, we also have a portfolio of research programs. The one that I'll mention is on external controls. Um, that's a, an especially important use case for data sharing. Um, there are many cancer types where the standard of care is evolving quickly and access to the data is slower than the rate at which the standard of care is changing. So we need quality uh, standard of care data much faster than we're able to achieve now. Um, so what brings us together today, and uh, there's a very large number of people already online, um, I think it's a shared uh, mission to optimize the value of the data that we're collecting from patients. And there's been progress, especially in terms of transparency. So compared to six or eight years ago, you can now uh, discover uh, much better than you could before what data has been generated. And there's metadata available for you to choose which of those databases might be relevant to your research. But we've got a lot of work to do when it comes to sharing data and reusing data. Only a tiny fraction of that discoverable data is shared and reused. So we do have a great panel of speakers today. Um, they'll deepen our understanding uh, about the barriers to data sharing. And they'll also share with us some uh, barrier busting examples of data sharing. Well, Donna, thank you again. Um, we have a great partnership. Um, my next task here is to introduce our, our keynote speaker. Um, it's both uh, an honor and a challenge to introduce uh, Dr. Robert Califf. Um, I say it's a challenge because he has done and is doing so much that if I go through the whole resume, uh, the time will run out. So I just picked off a few things um, that are uh, incredibly impressive. First of all, he's currently head of clinical policy and strategy for Verily and Google Health. He was previously vice chancellor for health data at Science and a named professor of cardiology at Duke. And he is a former commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. So given in the breadth of his experience and his understanding of this space, um, there is no one better to kick off the symposium today. So Rob, over to you. Thanks, Bill. I recognize I'm just a local warm-up band for the heavy duty bands that follow. It's um, uh, actually the three panels that have been put together have people I love to just talk with and also argue with, and I'm sure there'll be some good arguments to be had. 
<clears throat> as we go through the afternoon. So I look forward to hopefully stimulating some uh, thought about these topics as I go through them. First of all, th these were the instructions that I got about the purpose of the day, and I thought it was a fabulous um, set of instructions. This, this is about oncology, but I don't think the discussion needs to be onco-specific. I think the same principles hold regardless <clears throat> of the area of medicine or healthcare. Um, and a goal is to bring the patient view and the focus. And I'll talk about where I think that's gone astray and suggest some ways that um, maybe we can improve that focus. Um, and and I'm, as I say, I'm really looking forward to what the panelists have to say uh, as they go through how they uh, look at these issues. So here's my overview of at least the way I'm thinking about it right now. We First of all, we need to celebrate the progress that's been made. Secondly, um, I have a view that sharing data from traditional clinical trials um, is a great first step, but it's not where we need to be with regard to really improving health outcomes. We need to go far beyond that. And I think both Donna and Bill um, made a strong point there uh, in, in a similar way. Um, the goal, if our goal is to treat the right patients with the right treatment at the right time, we need access to a lot of data under conditions that are acceptable to people and in ways that they understand. But beyond just the data, to make sense of the data, um, I would argue that we've got to go from millions of people with data that they share to millions of people actively <clears throat> participating in research because um, dealing with data that's already been created is is important, but there is great value or even greater value in planning the research that's gonna be done prospectively and involving people in that work. So we gotta come up, I believe, with an approach that facilitates data sharing uh, to determine the best treatment so that we can improve outcomes, simple statement. Or a way to, um, a way to sort of put it into the form of a proposition, if you ask the question, What's the best way to be sure that my clinicians, me and my family, know which approach is best for me? Um, I would argue the best way is to make sure we have access to the data about as many people like me as possible, how they're treated and how they did after treatment. And here I would emphasize, and I think it has been a focus of Project Data Sphere, preferably using RCT data whenever possible uh, to ensure the estimates are not biased, but also including continuous updating of observational data. And, you know, my question all along is, um, do people believe this is the right proposition? And if so, what's holding us back from getting there? Because I feel like in my current job at Alphabet, I can say for sure technology is not the limiting factor. It's really the way that we think about and put guardrails around the data. So this is uh, one of my old slides that has been sort of been my mantra. I don't think um, we've invented really anything new when it comes to figuring out which approaches to intervening uh, on human disease and prevention um, are best. We, we have ideas, we test those ideas in clinical trials, the clinical trials that show good results. Uh, we take that knowledge and put it into guidelines we measure how well we uptake um, what we should be doing and where we find gaps in knowledge or gaps in performance using measurement and education, we try to make it better. This whole cycle um, can be speeded up tremendously if we have much broader participation and access to data. And to the extent that we make it difficult to deal with data, the cycle spins more slowly and the rate of improvement or the rate of undetected deterioration, which is a major issue in our society today, um, can, can really become a problem. But first, let me just celebrate the, the progress. And I say this having been brought in as a consultant to the Pharma CEO Roundtable in about 2008, at a time when the industry by and large, and I hear I talk about the medical products industry, I was talking with a tool already that um, I always like to point out that the healthcare delivery industry is many, many times larger than the medical products industry. And it's always seemed odd to me that we refer to one of them as the industry and the other 
we don't. But having said that, I was brought in by the CEO roundtable because there was a belief that if people had access to the clinical trials that were being done in clinicaltrials.gov, it would destroy the business model of pharma. Well, um, it turned out um, my advice was that's not correct. And several of us said the same thing. Things have happened. And lo and behold, now it is the standard to register clinical trials. And it's also the law, but not only to register clinical trials, but also to register the results. Here again, I'll pick on a tool in Harlan and just point out academia is lagging far behind the medical products industry in this regard, although it is getting better. But in terms of history, this is not a long period of time and a lot of progress has been made. And then we have um, a meeting that Harlan and I, I think we're both in, IOM 2013, beginning to talk about sharing participant level data, going through all the um, arguments. <clears throat> and this is from the publication from that meeting in 2013. I would argue that uh, Project Data Sphere is one example where so much progress has been made. And so if you look at one of the many publications, over 100, as Bill pointed out, you know, you'll really see the advantages and the learning that could go on when you combine data from different clinical trials, uh, having access to individual participant data. But that's not all. Um, when I say it's an esteemed panel, I really mean it because the other great example represented uh, on the next panel is Project Yoda which involves uh, Harlan's work at Yale and primarily J&J, &J, although I know it's meant to be broader and uh, is broadening. But um, in an overview of these efforts, um, it's obvious that we are making progress. And yet what I've learned as I prepared for this is that there are still the same obstacles pretty much across the board in how people think about sharing data. And we'll get to that later. And then finally, um, a tool um, has really got a magnificent example on the University of California system. And this is just from one of many publications. If you told me 20 years ago, we could start out with 5 million people uh, with their health records and look uh, in great detail at the treatments they were getting and their outcomes, I wouldn't have thought it was possible. But now it's not only possible, it's happening every day. And so we have to wonder, why don't we expand this even further? And we need to expand it. Um, I've sort of had a hobby as a cardiologist of pointing out that only about 15% or really now it's about 9% of our major clinical practice guideline recommendations in cardiovascular disease are based on high quality evidence. <clears throat> so I looked up oncology in preparation for this meeting and I found that, well, it's about 6%. And it hasn't improved really much since 2011. What we have are a lot of recommendations based on expert consensus. And it's not to say there's not good data or that the consensus is wrong. I'd much rather have expert consensus than nothing at all. But you have to wonder uh, with the technology we now have why we can't implement uh, research systems that get us the answers uh, in a definitive way much more quickly. And all I need to say is uh, hydroxychloroquine, convalescent plasma, and ivermectin to point out that this is uh, a primary issue for our day. Um, how do we get the machine operating faster so we get the evidence that people need so that they get the right treatment? And I would argue this is not just a convenience. Up until maybe 10 years ago, um, I would have had the attitude that the US was exceptional that our health outcomes were phenomenal and that our technology was supreme. And therefore making things better is a great thing to do, but the urgency was not there. But if we now, uh, we're all well aware that the US has fared poorly in the pandemic relative to other countries. What we talk about a lot less is that beginning in about 2010, we've seen a deterioration in our overall life expectancy compared with the rest of the world, which has been growing every day. <laughs> Uh, before the pandemic, it was at three years lower life expectancy in the U.S. than our comparator countries. And the estimate based on the results of the pandemic so far is that this is almost five years now shorter life expectancy if you're in the U.S.
compared to um, other high income countries. But of course, this is not a uniform effect. And in fact, if you live in San Francisco or Boston or Raleigh, Durham, um, you pretty much look like high income European countries in terms of uh, health outcomes and life expectancy. But if you're a mon minority or you're uh, poorly educated or economically poor, it looks quite different um, as demonstrated um, in this slide. Interestingly published in the British Medical Journal, I'm not sure why it's not uh, in a US journal. Of course, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that the one bright area since 2010 has been cancer. So the massive investment that's been made in cancer is paying off, but I would argue that over time, cancer will be part of the rest of the landscape and we better pay attention to all of it. So I wanna point out, I'm not an oncologist. I'm not an expert in cancer. I happen to have hung out with some experts um, in my previous career as uh, this uh, old photo from the Roosevelt Room shows. And I do wanna commend uh, the FDA and the Center for Excellence in Oncology with the work uh, that's been done, which I think has made a difference. All right, so how do, how do I see it if I step back and look at um, data sharing? And I think almost every healthcare entity says that it's patient-centered. And the idea is that at the center of everything should be patients and their families, the people they care about. I would also argue that if you talk to patients, they highly value happy and involved clinicians. And it's this dyad that really, I believe, should be at the center of data and data sharing. But if we look at the reality, the system is not organized around this dyad. The system is organized in a very fragmented manner that makes it almost impossible to put the data together in the ways that we could easily do it um, if we had the human systems in sync with the technological uh, systems. So what if cancer patients and clinicians banded together to optimize the informa information base for high quality evidence-based care? All these things on the right um, would happen much faster and self-correction could be a, a routine part of the system. And I think um, uh, Donna and Bill both made that point in a different way. And then all the organizations which should be supporting this dyad, um, other carers and caregivers, uh, advocacy groups, health systems, research sites, would be focused on sharing information uh, for the benefit of the beneficiaries shown here. And those who make medical products and those who pay for healthcare would likewise be sharing information because it's the only way um, to know that we're improving outcomes as we deliver care. What we're missing is a systematic approach to a transparent shared um, base of data that gives everyone equal access in a symmetric way to the information that's needed to put the checks and balances in the system. Instead, what we have are a number of entities which are highly incented to not share the data because with not sharing data comes a lot of power and a lot of control. There's a term for this called suboptimization used in the business world. And I think our $3.8 trillion health system is the largest uh, suboptimized enterprise in the history of the world, as far as I know. And so um, the ways that this should operate are not new and have been envisioned for years. This is from an old HMO uh, slide, um, just making the point as the tool has done in the UC system, and we'll hear more about it, I'm sure, uh, during that panel. Um, every time someone touches a healthcare system, uh, their information um, could benefit not only them, but also other people like them if it were shared and aggregated in the right way. In the research system, instead of having passive surveillance, it's haphazard and hard to put together. Just look at the, the, at the arguments right now about the waning of vaccine efficacy. Um, it's challenging to find the right balance between pre and post-market, especially in an area like oncology where people have made the point and laws have been passed so that enable um, 
uh, rapid approval uh, with a commitment in the post market. And we have two systems, one for research and one for clinical practice that are not directly linked together, leading to a lot of inefficient one-off studies. If you just interrogate clinicaltrials.gov with regard to COVID, I don't really need to say more. I think everyone's aware of the huge number of small trials that will never um, advance knowledge in the field that are sapping a lot of our energy. What if we went to a national or global system that had this patient centricity sharing information for the benefit of individuals and populations so that we could have active surveillance that's constantly ongoing, embed clinical trials into the system um, and leverage real world evidence to support the regulatory decisions that are needed so people can get earlier access, but also with assurance that um, as time goes on, uh, the facts will come out from better done studies. We also need to account for the fact that anything we do will have benefits and risks. And one of the um, fallouts of our current system is we're often aware of the risk in po the post-market period before we're aware of additional or prolonged benefits. And a more active constant system would give us a better likelihood. And then the other additional thing, which has been very obvious to me in my job at Alphabet is that um, if we were sharing information symmetrically, um, I, I keep trying to come up with something better than the triple aim or what I really like is the quadruple aim because I do think happy engaged clinicians are critical to the well being of patients. Um, the focus has been too much just on lowering cost, not enough on the patient experience or the clinician experience. And we still don't have a way of measuring global outcomes in people over time. Something that Michael Porter pointed out in his original article, he and his colleagues about uh, value-based care, that if you can't measure the total outcome, uh, you're very much at risk of this sub-optimization um, conundrum. So just a quick word about technology, since I do work for a technology company, I think uh, current technology is absolutely not the limiting factor but it's a, it's a nuclear weapon. Um, it can be used for tremendous benefit for all, or it could be used to further balkanize uh, the population. As you might argue, has happened to some extent uh, in oncology because of the financial toxicity and the very different access to expensive therapies that people with insurance and means have compared to others. But we no longer have to worry about information being available if we choose to make it so. We've gone from this way of getting information of going to the library and checking out a book to this. And I'm still astounded by the ongoing record with regard to COVID downloads on YouTube now over 500 billion. And so it's not that people wouldn't look at information if they, if they had it, but we have to uh, give them access to information that's useful um, so that when they share it, they get something back. And it's not just the health records that uh, are in play here. We also now can go beyond looking at just one part at the time to looking at the environment that the person was in. And I would argue that the COVID tracker that we all look at every day, and I stopped looking at it for about a week and then the Delta wave hit. So I'm back looking at it every day. But um, if you look at a map of a county of a state of a country or of the world, you can see the health outcomes and geospatial resolution that's profound. And no reason that shouldn't happen with regard to other health problems that we have, because the solution is surely not just individual data sharing, but it's data sharing about communities and populations. And I think we've learned in the work that we've done trying to marry the technology with volunteers, for example, in the baseline project with Stanford and Duke University, that um, people are actually willing to share a lot of data if they have confidence that their uh, trusted clinicians are in favor of it and they have confidence that the data will be handled appropriately and to the extent that they want it, they're assured they'll get uh, a return of something from that information that they donate. So in my dream world, um, if, if we had the right rules of the game and I, I hope the panel will get to the rules um, 
uh, we would be able to combine all these different types of information to provide the decision support that patients need with those who they trust to help them make healthcare decisions, including clinicians and families and carers. And for populations, um, we would aggregate the information by disease type or cancer type or geographic location and make better policy decisions. And it's hard to argue we're doing that very well right now, even though we do have more data than we've ever had. And ultimately the trade-offs would be explicit about, po about populations versus individuals. So finally, just two last slides, what's holding this back? And I, it's been interesting to me as I've talked to people over the last couple of weeks preparing for this, I hear the same things. No one who's an expert believes that HIPAA makes it impossible, but um, something about the ability to say it's a HIPAA issue still um, holds a lot of things back. There is no question that health systems are blocking data sharing because they regard data as an asset. There's no question that companies are blocking data, that is pharma companies and uh, device companies, because they're concerned about the consequences of transparency, giving away trade secrets, making comparative effectiveness possible, in which case the product might be shown to be inferior to another. And still, I think not unreasonable concerns about improper comparative effectiveness being done or issues of safety being raised by non-experts who don't understand the data. But at the core of all this is uh, whether people trust others with their data and whether people want to share their data. And I think wanting to share is not the case not the issue for 90% of Americans. I think the polls are clear about that. I think the issue is, can we create an environment and a set of rules that assure them that they can trust that their data will be used for the purposes that they value? So these are my questions for the day that I'm sure the panels will answer clearly. Is the, is the argument flawed that sharing of data is beneficial? What policies and strategies can overcome these arguments against sharing? What policies and strategies can best protect against misuse? What can convince health systems that it's in the interest of their patients uh, who should be served by the systems to share data for better understanding of effective and ineffective interventions? And what can turn data sharing into a positive net present value calculation for the medical products industry? So I hope this is where it will end up. Um, obviously not at the end of the day, but over uh, the uh, next uh, relatively short period of time. Thanks, and I hope this has been helpful.